created this thing called Publish Subscribe, which was the start of event-driven computing many years ago. I'm a little bit older than I probably look. <laughs> but um, at the time I was doing this um, and came up with this, it was literally um, it was mainframe world pr predominantly. And we were just starting the Sun revolution when Sun Microsystems was coming in and companies like that. Oh, shoot, that's really, <laughs> I know. Um, and so during that time, uh, we were all thinking about how do you get information between people and sharing information. I was building systems uh, around that time. And so I came up, I had a dream, literally had a dream of uh, how to do this using something uh, that uh, became known as publish subscribe or uh, you know, event driven computing. And that's the, the really the genesis of uh, the whole messaging paradigm uh, at that time. We sold this into the financial <coughs> services market and everybody just took off on the idea of event-driven computing and the notion of messaging as a way to deliver information between applications and users. Uh, it was hard selling at first. A lot of people, this is amazing to me, but uh, we would go to many companies and they would be perfectly happy with getting their monthly reports. <laughs> they didn't see any need for real-time information at all. Uh, <laughs> And um, they were fine with their batch mainframe report. So nothing seemed wrong. Uh, but the financial services sector really saw the, the value of having uh, real-time information and having this you know, just-in-time, event-driven kind of approach. Uh, as the web grew, we saw an explosion of interest in more and more information being available uh, real-time. But the web, uh, we never could get Cisco to put the publish subscribe paradigm into the routers. Um, there are some scalability problems you come up with that I, it could take a little while to get into and I don't want to get into it. So what in, instead what happened is we had a parallel architecture, the web services architecture evolved. And that's sort of how we got event driven computing. At first it was kind of a kludge. Like you, at first web services and, and that whole paradigm was a pull model which did not deliver information in real time. You had to ask for information and then it was stale as soon as you looked at it on your screen. Uh, and that was fine for a lot of people. Um, Google itself, I'll show, you know, uh, uh, so big advantages of this publish subscribe paradigm that I came up with is that it's real time simultaneous delivery to everybody. The fact that the data was self describing and that everything was auto discovered was really powerful powerful features that simplified the programming model, made it much easier to operate. And it really solved a problem that people were starting to see back then and is today very prominent in many organizations who, who implement a more point-to-point -point architecture and don't use a messaging backbone. This is the kind of problem I've seen. There was one, mess one bank I went to, actually the hedge fund, and they had this problem in spades and they, they, they had no agility. That everything just, after a while, when you, when you use a, an undisciplined approach to how you c connect everything, like you get these kinds of diagrams, which are very common in most larger organizations, and your code becomes very, very <coughs> fragile, which means it's almost impossible to make changes to your enterprise. Uh, it's very difficult, and the cost rises, and they were finding that they called it the pile. The pile of things they needed to do just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they couldn't get anything done because every time they changed something, it broke 17 other things that needed to be fixed. So the changes were just enormous. And a lot of times it wasn't even documented well what was going on. So this kind of architecture has, a, has fundamental problems that way. Um, you know, even Google uh, uses a point-to-point, -point, uses the web services architecture. And when they index sites, basically they go around and they basically ask every single IP address that's possible, are you there? <laughs> and uh, that takes time. In the original days of the internet, it takes six months sometimes for them to search every single IP address that was possible. Uh, today, they're much faster, obviously. They've got a lot of technology, but basically it's the same thing. And even today, Google will say, we have no guarantees about how often or when we will, we will scan your site for changes. It's not real time, right? Imagine, though, if the cloud <coughs> was real time, if it was published, subscribe, if every time a, a website or a piece of information changed, you could subscribe to it and get a piece of data back that said, you know, this was what changed on that topic. Now that, that would be really powerful, but we never got that, like I said, Cisco and us could never figure out how to make that really work well. Maybe it will someday. One of the most exciting things to me about 
uh, all of this is that the new world of IoT and IIoT, uh, Internet of Things and the Industrial Internet of Things, which I'll talk about tomorrow too, uh, is that it's all published subscribed. It's going back to the original paradigm. So the, in all of these new protocols in the Internet of Things, they're all published subscribed and they all leverage the same tools. But what, what emerged uh, from all of that messaging technology we built was a standard set of tools, and I'll describe those set of tools. First, I want to talk about what's been happening over the last 10 years. So since the emergence of Google and a number of other companies in the Valley, they have been sharing source code to try to scale their enterprises, to, be, to figure out a way to get to, to scale to the size they need. And in doing so, they have reverted or reverted, opted to go open source. And so almost all of these companies, as uh, the guy from, uh, what was it, uh, YPro this morning was talking, almost all these companies have built themselves now on open source software. And it's represented an incredible acceleration of innovation. They're, and I attribute it directly to open source and to APIs, but mainly to open source initially and still. You see an incredible growth in the number of open source projects and the importance of those projects is critical and you really can't live today without open source in your enterprise. And he talked about an open source first policy and I agree, I see more and more enterprises coming to WSO2 all the time saying, we are having an open source first policy, we need to talk to an open source vendor. So it's clear that the direction is, is going in this way and, I, and open source is a key part of this whole virtuous circle of explosive innovation. Uh, all of these things leverage each other and I have some blogs if you uh, want to check out my blog sometime, I have some really interesting blogs on how all these things play together and why they each reinforce each other. But this has driven an enormous amount of inv innovation and it's changed in a way the way we think about event-driven computing and, and how this is done with all of this new software. So let's talk about that. Uh, this is the set of tools that we built uh, in, in the original days of the event-driven architecture. So these are the components. Uh, some of you may be familiar with these components or not, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know how much I want to rehash some of this old technology, but it's, it's the same old technology. WSO2 has all these pieces of technology, as you know. Um, we have all the components of that infrastructure in our platform. Uh, these were chosen for a reason. Uh, they weren't just random things that popped up. There was a logic behind why these particular tools were organized the way they were. They each solved a problem in a certain way that was a tool that was useful for that kind of problem. And more importantly, uh, it also provided a way for non-programmers to start to modify the enterprise. So one of the big problems is when you're looking at that big spaghetti, spaghetti diagram, you require programmers to change anything at all, <laughs> the slimpest little thing. With this kind of technology, you can even automate this to the point where a regular business person can go in and make changes to the operation of the, of the entire, our entire enterprise. So for instance, but they're, they're organized in an orthogonal way along some axes. And most people don't understand this, but um, there's a dimensionality to these technologies. So for instance, a business process manager is really good at handling long running processes, processes that might take weeks to get done. You know, wouldn't put that into an ESB. An ESB wouldn't want to have a thread active for weeks. <laughs> It wants microsecond, milliseconds or something, right, for threads to be alive. You don't want to wait weeks. So these problems are optimized for those kinds of different problems. The same thing with rules. If you look at, uh, say, for instance, you want to you give a discount at a certain volume, you could put that in a governance registry and say, like, okay, here's my, I'm going to make this available to everybody. It's a 20% discount on this dollar value or something. But if you're an organization that might have a more complex set of pricing, which it would, might depend on 20 factors about the customer, the relationship, the, what they buy into, you know, other factors. You might want to have a rules engine that you specify the kinds of rules that, uh, you know, define that pricing structure. For that, you need a rules engine. You wouldn't put a rule in a, in a governance registry. It just doesn't make any sense. So what this is saying is you need the entire platform because each of the tools of the platform corresponds to a different problem set and is optimized for that problem set. And if you try to use a tool that isn't appropriate for that problem set, 
you usually run into problems. You run, that's where you run into scalability and some fragility problems. And so these tools are all there, and you'd like to use them all. But if you go to a typical enterprise uh, you know, sale company like a TIBCO that I used to work for, and you wanted the whole shebang, get ready to put out a lot of money because they will, they will ask for a lot of money for all that technology. The nice thing about WSO2 is you can get all these pieces if you want and use the right tool for the right thing. And I think that's a great, uh, a great uh, advantage to, the, to open source and to WSO2 in particular because even a lot of the other open source companies only have a single part of that puzzle. And that means if you're going to have three or four of those, you have to find three or four vendors, two vendors, whatever it is, and then you have to figure out how to integrate them, which means you have another project, which is an integration project. So it's obviously better if you can get it all from one vendor. We've known this for years, you know, single sourcing. We don't like to do it sometimes, but uh, in the case of uh, technology like this, there's risk in buying from too many vendors. Okay, so <clears throat> there are a lot of advantages to the publish subscribe paradigm over the web services paradigm. And I won't go into all the detail here because we really don't have the time and there's a lot of slides to cover. But um, there's a lot of material in this deck and you can obviously download it after the presentation and, uh, and look at it and I'll, I'll go through it. So we've had in the last 10 years this massive innovation that I talked about. All these things, cloud is a $130 billion business. The IoT is expected to be $14 trillion in like five years. Uh, billions of devices, the mobile phones are billions of, of them, social's huge. How has this changed the technology space, right? Uh, well, what you have is, in most organizations, a, an agglomeration of massive amounts of older technology and different technologies, and then all, a, a smattering of this new technology. And when the organization looks at how am I going to adopt this new technology and what technology should I use for the new thing I do, uh, you know, you need an architecture that allows you to glue together the old technology and the new technology, which is essentially integration pieces. That's the stuff that we did at TIBCO. It's the same stuff that we do at WSO2. That's what I always said about, I loved about this integration space, is that the more things change, the more need there is for integration. <laughs> so it's always new, it's always interesting, and we always have some fun things to do. And integrating the old with the new is a, is a big part of the business. Is, you know, you've got old APIs. You, you, you called them SOAP then, or you called them uh, before then, you know, uh, Kicks or some other thing that you were using. Now, you know, you, you've got APIs, RESTful APIs. Uh, so how do you merge those things together? Well, that's, that's the genius of WSO2. So uh, we have built not only the old patterns, so the ones in blue here are the old technologies, which we've upgraded to be able to handle things like the new technology. So for instance, our message broker uses big data as its store for the data that comes in. Why not? Of course, it makes sense. Uh, the same thing, our pattern complex event processor will run off of any big data stream you flow into it or multiple streams and you can look at data all across it very fast. The same thing with um, you know, all of our services, our data services can sit in front of a big data store as well as in front of it. But we've also added the other important pieces that are needed in this new technology. For instance, the API management, it's the most important, pro if you ask me, it's the most important product WSO2 has. It's the most important product any company should be looking at. You should be thinking about APIs as the center of how you rebuild your enterprise, you refactor your enterprise. That's my opinion. Uh, I think that's the new way we build the enterprise. And why? Mainly because of reuse. What we're getting with APIs is massive reuse and a dramatic improvement in productivity. That's just on top of the DevOps and some other things is creating a massive increase in productivity. Uh, you can't open an app today that doesn't have dozens of web services they're using out in the cloud. And uh, I calculated out there are 100 billion API calls per minute happening in the cloud today. So everything is, is basically, if you just think of the cloud, as this massive interconnected APIs that are all talking to each other. And every time you open an app, you're just you know, in a network of uh, different applications and services coming from everywhere. And that's the way the world is, an efficient way to build software today. And it's definitely something you should be leveraging. So API management, but also, as we get into IoT, device management. We used to just consider device ma uh, management as for mobile phones. Some companies had it, some didn't. As we get into this IoT world, device management is going to be a critical factor in this whole architecture. Uh, and 
the cloud is, of course, critical. So we've added the cloud pieces and all the security pieces. So this means that WS2 has adopted essentially all the new technology and made it easy for you to adopt that technology through its integration. Now, most organizations that I talk to are struggling under multiple evolutions. So I'm a physicist uh, training back at MIT and uh, before, and, and I always love, uh, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term of unitary evolution, but it's a quantum mechanical term. Anyways, uh, most organizations today are fighting to decide uh, what kind of change they need to have in their organization. Are they moving towards you know, the cloud? Are they doing all the cloud things? Of course, most are. A multi-hundred billion dollar business, so there's a lot of evolution in that direction. But as I said, uh, uh, the majority of companies we talk to, the first thing they're considering is APIs. API is a key part of how you should be refactoring your enterprise. So API evolution of the enterprise is key. Everybody should be working on their API evolution. Uh, and then you can't deny and ignore the fact that you know everything is moving to a mobile world and now to an IoT world. There's an incredible amount of excitement around IoT. Um, and the possibilities. When Apple opened up their App Store back in 2007, it's hard to believe it was only eight years ago that the first smartphone came out. Uh, you know, it's a, if you count the Blackberry, maybe it was before then. But uh, they put that phone out and they opened up an App Store and within two years there were 600,000 applications. It created an enormous swell of an entrepreneurial excitement innovation. The same thing is happening with IoT on a massive scale, much bigger than that. Like a 10 times as big as that, 100 times as big as that. The giant companies are migrating and moving very fast to IoT. So this is something you can't ignore. You've got to be thinking about what is my IoT strategy? Should I be involved in the IoT strategy? Should I be using it? Should I be you know, enabling it? Should I be working? So you've got to be thinking about your IoT strategy and big data. Of course, that was the thing last year. I think there's no question that that's continuing uh, this year. Everybody realizes the digitization or the, whatever you want to call it, the, the ability to take advantage of all the social and all the other technologies by gathering the data and then leveraging it for, for value uh, is incredibly important. So these four evolutions are in competition at most organizations. And you know that means uh, what technology are you buying? Are you buying one of those? Are you buying all four of them? And then do they work together? How do you do that? Well, you need it. You should be thinking and talking to companies who can do uh, things that you know work on all four of these different evolutions. Um, if you're looking at you know your virtual enterprise, this is what I, I think the future of the cloud is that virtually every organization will be virtual. So every service, everything they do will be in the cloud. Now, obviously, it's going to take 10 or 20 years for many companies to get to. But a lot of small companies today are there already. They're 100% virtual. Like they, they don't run anything locally. They have no services. And that leads to incredible cost advantages, which I talk about in some cloud talks and stuff. But <clears throat> basically, it's all these pieces. You need to be able to run and utilize the cloud. Uh, and so you know, WS2, of course, has the complete cloud platform. And uh, we have just announced Enterprise app management, which uh, I could get into, but I think is a critical part of that whole uh, cloudification strategy and leveraging virtualization. So, of course, we talked about API evolution, refactoring the enterprise. This is, this is a must-have technology. Uh, I call it the network effect. We're seeing the, uh, the value of that, what's, what's happening. Uber is a good example, in my, in my opinion. Uh, you know, who knew that you could take two cell phones and create a $40, $50 billion valuation company uh, just by connecting them uh, together. The, I call that the network effect. Nobody knew. When we put publish subscribe into firms and you were able to gather information from across the firm in real time, people could do things they never imagined. And we saw that firsthand, which is why we, you know, there was this evolution of all this technology in the spaces. There was tremendous value being created. Well, the same thing is happening in the cloud with APIs and all that. You have to be in on the API evolution, and you, you think about the network effect of that. So it's a must, and uh, of course, pieces for that. Uh, I like this slide because I like to show how some of our customers have really worked the, the store front end to create a, a very nice uh, GUI for people to, to understand. Because the whole point of reuse and APIs is to make it friendly and easy to use those APIs, whether it's internal use of those APIs or external 
the real value that's being created out of this whole API movement is the reuse. And so if you're not making it easy for people to reuse and you not find and, and leverage it, then you're not getting the value of the whole API vision. And of course, the big data vision. And the big thing that WSO2 does, of course, is we provide the, uh, the dual, what's called the Lambda architecture, which allows you to do both uh, real-time processing and long-term analytics processing of all your stream data and allow you to get the best of both worlds. And there's talks about that. And the last one is the mobile IoT uh, an IIoT, industrial internet of things. And uh, there's really th three ways to look at that. So uh, the typical company will have three different ways of looking at IoT. One is they may use it in their organization to help improve the efficiency or operation automation of that organization. You know, a building. There are organizations with 7,000, 10,000, 15,000 devices for controlling everything. Those systems were typically controlled by proprietary systems in the past. Most of them are migrating over to, to IoT or to internet-based kinds of approaches because leveraging that network effect means you can get more automation, more intelligence, uh, hook it into big data, things that you just couldn't do before with these, with these systems. So there's a tremendous movement to try you know, and improve that in the, in the organization. And obviously many organizations are continuing down that road and doing that. But then there's going to be a tremendous need for uh, enterprises to support now, not just mobile phones, but other IoT devices that employees have. So uh, I believe that you know, for their productivity and stuff, most organizations have to be thinking about, what are the IoT devices that I need to support? So that's a different paradigm, a different model for how you use IoT in the organization. And the last one is, if co my customers are using IoT devices, how do I benefit from that, or how do I enable that and leverage that? Uh, you know, If it's something like I'm in a store, and the lighting allows the the customer to bring up an app and find their way around in the store and find deals and do things like this. Is there a way for me to provide that functionality or to leverage that functionality to create extra revenue? Uh, so you need to think about IoT in terms of all of these kinds of models. Um, so this leads to the new uh, architecture that includes all these pieces in a hub. Um, I call it platform three. This is all the pieces that you need. And uh, today's IoT infrastructure, a lot of it, is built on what's called a mesh architecture. It's, it's a published subscribe paradigm for distributing information among IoT devices in a, in a local area. This is, tradition, this is actually similar to what we did in trading floors in the old days. With, and it, it's similar to what the IP protocol works. Uh, with the mesh protocol, a, a message from this device here might not make it directly to the router and to a device. It might go through a set of other devices. And the advantage uh, is it might not need the power to reach that device. So that means you can make the device smaller because it only has to reach to the next device. It doesn't have to make it all the way to the router. Not only that, um, if this device here fails, it can still talk to that device because if it's doing this over wireless, these meshes allow the messages to go to multiple devices. So every message, just like in the publish subscribe paradigm, all the messages go to all the IoT devices that are of interest. They throw away the ones not interested. They help route the ones that they, they can help with. And so uh, if, it, if it turns out that guy's dead, this guy can, can do the job and, and route it up there. So that makes the whole network more reliable. It means that everything has to be lower power, less functionality, because you can leverage the functionality across all the devices, not just have to have all the functionality in every device for its functioning. That's incredibly beneficial. So this publish subscribe paradigm makes infinite sense to the IoT world and to the IoT world. This is why it's, it's so um, ubiquitous in all the protocols, all the standards, everything is uh, publish subscribe. So all of that in your building or wherever your infrastructure is, the house, if this is a house, would go into one of these, uh, one of these aggregation points call it a hub, whatever, but uh, you're building. But traditionally, you would do some of the technology locally because you want to make the decisions locally. One of the advantages of publish subscribe is you have the information coming from other devices locally. It doesn't have to go to the cloud first. It can come to me directly. I can use that information to make a decision now. I don't have to wait for the cloud or, or even have the cloud. The cloud could be down for all, for all intents and purposes. I can operate independently, autonomously, uh, on the information in the network. So you want to have that ability. Also, it just doesn't make sense to pour the gazillion bytes of information 
that every company and every business and every home would have up into the cloud for every, every device. You'd want to process it locally to some extent and then only deliver to the cloud that, that is interesting to the, to the cloud. So um, this architecture makes sense locally. And then uh, the next level is, uh, you know, you might have several of these buildings or infrastructure, and then you need a similar kind of architecture in the cloud to make decisions and orchestrate events, uh, put the logic in for how you're going to integrate and, and use all these devices and leverage the events that come off of them. And uh, then, of course, you'll have your employees and your customers and all have to talk in through this and be managed through this infrastructure. There's kind of an overall architecture for that. Uh, this is my general IoT and IoT uh, reference architecture diagram, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now, but um, it has the notion of an individual device having uh, the need for communication and routing capability. Uh, usually there's some kind of common communications provider between that and, say, hubs, uh, which then locally process a lot of information, provide rules, uh, security, uh, you know, discovery, and other things like that. Usually there's also a separate capability for doing UI on all the information and control uh, aspects, but you, the, the actual control and orchestration is done inside of there. But then uh, information has to flow up into the cloud where you have further orchestration and further data analysis and, uh, and more. And uh, I, d I document, if you go to my blogs, you can read some of this. I, I talk about each of the providers and the companies that are in these spaces uh, and what they do. Uh, it's, it's an interesting market as it's growing. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I think these are interesting. When, if you pull the slide deck down, you'll see uh, I have a whole bunch of examples of basically the whole architecture of these technologies from enterprise service buses, uh, complex event processors, all of these tools being used uh, in traditional architectures. Now, I'm very familiar with the financial world coming from TIBCO. We built a lot of trading floors, a lot of banking infrastructure, so I know a lot about these. These guys uh, look at a, how a message broker or information bus, as we call them, is, is in, integrated inside of a bank. Uh, here's an example of how you would use some of the EDA components to build an event-driven, real-time infrastructure inside of a bank uh, and integrate the information and solutions. Uh, here's an example. Uh, that I created around uh, a new taxi service called Ufer uh, and <laughs> the kinds of tools they would use. And it's a lot of the standard EDA tools. You could be up and running uh, making Ufer taxis tomorrow and be competing with Uber, you know, uh, uh, you know in the $40 billion market. Uh, so online sales, very big user. As you know, eBay, other companies use WSO2 a lot. Uh, and uh, we, we can provide a lot of value in uh, helping you build that infrastructure. Uh, we have a lot of customers in the health business uh, and very important new open source so, uh, solution. A lot of uh, new companies and the states are moving towards an open source framework for their health systems. I think it's brilliant and will lead to a lot of cost reduction. Uh, so uh, this is an example of some of the EDA architecture used in a health environment. My favorite IoT device <laughs> of all is the Tesla. I happen to own one. I love that car. Uh, they have a 99% satisfaction rating for two years in a row. I'm one of the 99%. Uh, it's extremely, extremely fun and satisfying car. Uh, one reason is, of course, it downloads and improves itself every few weeks. Every few weeks I get a new upgrade with all kinds of new features. I mean, how many times have you bought a car and you're getting improvements like every few weeks? It's pretty exciting to walk into your car in the morning and not know if you got some new features in there. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, the car has uh, so much going for it, and it really I'll talk about it more in another lecture, but uh, you know, this is an architecture for a connected car. Uh, one of our customers, Trimble, is uh, really big in the construction and some other spaces, and uh, this is an architecture around that. So you can look at those architectures if you're interested. Uh, here's a health, another health. Architecture, how am I doing on time? I don't know if I'm, it seems like I must be running out. Oh, I'm four minutes over, okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, I'll just head out. So the basic advantage of, of our enterprise uh, event-driven architecture is we give you most of the tools so that it comes down to you just having the right uh, the business logic, and most of the times that can be written almost by a non-programmer. So uh, there's, you can put together stuff very fast with uh, our platform, and, and uh, so that's me, and uh, like it if you look at my blog and my Twitter handle. Thank you very much. <laughs>